All right, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed Innovation Station. Uh, thank you again for returning. We have um, uh, two speaker presentations this afternoon, followed by a panel, and then we will reconvene back at um, uh, the Twing Center for Happy Hour. So uh, with that said, um, I believe Dean Cyrus Taylor, Taylor of our College of Arts and Sciences will come out and introduce our next speaker. Thanks very much. I'm Cyrus Taylor, Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences here at Case Western Reserve University, and I am delighted to welcome you today to introduce this afternoon's keynote speaker, Dr. Kurt Carlson. Kurt is the former president and CEO of SRI, Inc., and founder and CEO of the Practice of Innovation. He is a pioneer and thought leader in the development and use of innovation best practices and has advised government agencies, businesses, and foundations around the world. In his time serving as SRI's president and CEO from 1998 to 2014, SRI's revenue more than tripled. SRI became a global model for the systematic creation of high-value innovations such as HDTV, Siri, and many other world-changing advances. Among many honors and awards, Kurt was named a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors in 2012. He was selected to serve on President Obama's National Advisory Council on Innovation and Entrepreneurship, and he was a founding member of the Innovation Leadership Council for the World Economic Forum. With co-author William Wilmot, Kurt wrote Innovation, The Five Disciplines for Creating What Customers Want, and he's now finishing a new book, Creating Abundance Through Innovation Across Society. Kurt received his Bachelor of Science degree in Physics from Worcester Polytechnic Institute and Master's and PhD degrees from Rutgers University. We are thrilled that he is here at Case Western Reserve University today to speak uh, at our first Innovation Summit. Please join me in welcoming Kurt Carlson. Thank you so much. Well, welcome. It's so wonderful to be back here um, at Case um, and see the progress that not only Case is making, but um, the city of Cleveland. It's really, in the last five years, it's been transformative. and. Um, can't thank everybody and congratulate people enough for all the great work they've done. So I'm going to talk today about innovation. Um, does this work? Yeah. And I'm going to call it innovation for impact. Um, how can we dramatically improve our innovative performance across society? Um, as you just heard, um, I was CEO of SRI for 16 years. And when I went, SRI had been in decline for 20 years. We were $30 million in debt, um, and if we'd broken our bank covenants, the, the institute probably would have gone away. And over my tenure, we um, not only tripled the size of SRI, but you can see some of the things that we um, have done, um, easily creating more than $50 billion of new economic value in the marketplace. Um, High-definition television, satellite broadcasting, um, Siri, uh, that was bought by Apple and many other things. And the question I want to put in your mind is, how could it be that a 2,000 person research organization could go from almost bankrupt to creating that amount of new economic value? So it is now considered to be one of the most productive research laboratories in the world. And as you'll see, it's not about the people. People are great. It's not about the technologies. They were fine. It's not about the location. It's about how we worked and how we had to change the way we worked. And that's what's happening here at Case as well. I'm going to be talking about innovation best practices. We've done workshops on innovation all over the world with leading companies, universities, um, and government organizations. Um, so the things I'm going to be saying to you are not casual comments. Um, they're things that we've experienced over and over and over again firsthand. And as we've been talking about, and Jim's great talk pointed out, innovation now is the primary path to prosperity, meaningful jobs, environmental sustainability, social responsibility, and national security. It's what we do that will determine all those things. But as we know, and you've heard this morning, it's a challenging time. Uh, Jim pointed out that um, new companies are now declining faster than they're being created. 
That used to be the source of primary source of new jobs in America. And in spite of great programs like the ones here at Case and many other universities, you might have thought that that would have created a, a renaissance and the burst and the growth of new companies, but it hasn't. We still have not been successful. Jim also mentioned the middle class income, which as you can see for the last 15 years has been going down. As less job security, the sharing economy, Uber and companies like that mean that there'll be more people who are independent contractors, and that's not so easy. And competition has just begun. We're probably competing with about 500 million people around the world today. Eventually, it will be three, maybe even four billion people. And it's sobering to realize that every week, a million people are moving from the suburbs or the, the farms into cities in China. China has more honor students than we have students. And automation is everywhere. Driverless cars, again, we talked about that complete robotic factories, um, service robots, and uh, personal assistants. So um, Siri, which we created, was on the iPhone, but we've created five other companies um, in that same space. One is for electronic banking. So you can basically eliminate a teller at every regional office with, uh, with a computer-activated um, device. We're in the, what I call the global innovation economy. It has a number of properties, exponential progress. As soon as things become based on bits, they tend to go at rapid exponential rates. Intense competition um, and growing. Uh, new business models, I'll talk about that. Um, but also endless opportunities, which I'll talk about. And of course, you all know Moore's Law on the bottom. So it used to be, um, if you were in a business, you'd be attacked from the top or the bottom. So Tesla's an example of attacking the auto industry from the top. So the PC was an example of attacking mainframe computers from the bottom. But today, companies are increasingly being attacked from the side. What's the chance that the taxi industry ever would have invented Uber? But all of a sudden, Uber comes along and it tears it apart. And that's going to be happening with lots of different industries, whether it's retail, medical services, and other places. And it's really hard if one of you are the established players to adapt fast enough to even begin to think about competing. Um, we also talked this morning on Nolan about endless opportunities. I don't want to go through these, but if you look at any technological area of significance today, they're all in transition. How many billion dollar opportunities do you think there are in the world today? One? Ten? A hundred? It's probably thousands. There's never been in the history of the world a better time for innovation than today. Never. I've never seen so many big opportunities. But, and there's a really big but, again, you have to do the right things if you want to capture them and you want to have your company be sustainable. Markets. We got the biggest markets in the world. It's sobering to realize that Apple only has 7.5% of the market share in China. Basically, the world is wide open to the companies that we're imagining. So we don't lack for markets, we don't lack for technology, we don't lack for opportunities. What we lack for are the policies and the working procedures that allow us to capture our fair share of those. Here's a curve I like from Creative Destruction. It shows the lifetime of the top 500 companies. I'm sure some of you have seen this. Um, it's a funny looking curve because of these big ups and downs. That's where companies either last longer or go away faster depending on the business cycle. And you can see how periodic that is. But the point I want to mention here is that it, you know, 100 years ago, companies would stick around for 70 or 100 years before they went away. Now when you become one of the top 500 companies in the world, on the average, You've got 18 years left before you go away. Apple, Microsoft, Google, uh, Cisco, you name it. This says half of them are going to be gone 18 years from now. And the curve, if you extrapolate it out, it's probably continuing to go down because indeed the world is going faster. It's really hard to adapt once you have a business model to the speed of innovation outside your company. 
Kodak goes from number one to out of business in 10 years. Google buys Motorola's uh, mobility group, the heart and soul of that company, and then they sell it to a Chinese company. And Nokia goes from number one to out of business in seven years. These companies had everything, brilliant people, partners, money, market presence, everything you worked so hard to get. And just a decade later, they're gone. In fact, poor performance is everywhere. Even in Silicon Valley, where I am, 10% of the VCs make essentially all the money. Um, 50, 60 to 70% of them lose money every year in the best ecosystem in the world. Over 60% of products either fail directly or are so disappointing they really don't count in one year. And in all the workshops we've done where executives come in and we help them incubate their most important projects, when they're done after three days, typically less than 20% of them, do they decide, have any value for the company. I never would have believed that. Most of what they're working on is waste. Even if they were successful, it would make no difference. Indeed, innovation is a mystery to most. Every other CEO will give lip service to the idea that the world is moving faster and we need to do a better job in innovation. But if you go into an organization and ask the people to describe their innovation system, you get blank looks. They have none. This is the test. The next time you go into a company, find a middle-level manager who, by definition, has the job to innovate and ask them to describe their innovation system. If they can't, they don't have one. And I can almost guarantee that you'll find that in 90% of the companies you visit. They have none. There are many bad ideas. Fail fast to succeed early. If you're from Asia and somebody tells you to fail fast, you, you shudder. It just scares people to death. And it doesn't tell you what to do. That's a terrible idea. It's a terrible idea. What you want to do is learn fast. Yes, you're going to make a lot of mistakes on the way, but you always do when you're learning fast. And when you say learn fast, it begins to tell you what you need to do to be successful. How, may, how fast do you think Nolan, for example, was, was innovating and learning when he was forming his companies? Unbelievable, right? Nonstop, every way he could, every day. That's what it takes. Here's a classic example. I'm sure you've all heard of this quote, build a better mousetrap and the world will beat a path to your door. There have been over 6,000 mousetrap patents, and only 10 have had any success. Those are the two best sellers. What are those other 5,990 um, patents? They're waste. They may have gotten a patent, which means they're novel, they can be implemented, they haven't been done before, but nobody wants them. They're waste. And people get the inputs and the outputs of innovation confused. The inputs are creativity, R&D, invention and IP, teamwork, management, entrepreneurship. Those are inputs. They're not outputs. What we're after is the output, high value innovations. So you have to measure the right things. If you're measuring IP, you're measuring the wrong thing. You want to measure the outputs. Which brings up the question of, well, what is the definition for innovation? So here's the definition we use. The creation and delivery of new customer value in the marketplace with a sustainable business model. You have to create and deliver new value to your customers. They have to use it in the marketplace, unlike those mousetrap patents. And it has to have a sustainable business model. I've asked this question of thousands of senior executives. Nobody has mentioned sustainable business model. Not one person, ever. So when people are talking about innovation, they've got this funny idea in their head. And that slows you down. That's not good. So we think of innovation, value creation, as a discipline. It's not the result of luck or lone genius. It's really a family of best practices, a playbook, if you will. Focus on markets and customers, common language, concepts, and tools and processes to rapidly improve the value that you're trying to create. 
It's a competitive comp uh, it's a um, competitive advantage for the few companies that do that, like IDO or Procter and Gamble or SRI. Those companies who do have a powerful innovation process, um, it's really the basis of their main competitive advantage. It's important to everybody in this room. It's important to every professional to know how to create value. That is the rarest skill in the world. How do you create value for your customers? Whether you're a professor creating new programs for your students, or you're in a company, or in the government. And the thing that I'm about to tell you may seem easy, but they're not. They're really, really hard. So you have to keep it simple, or else you'll overwhelm people. I wrote a book. Um, we broke um, innovation into five buckets just to organize them. Um, I'm not going to go through everything uh, today. I'm going to focus on um, important customer and market needs um, and value creation. Um, but in a longer talk, I would talk about all the ingredients. I just want to mention innovation champions and teams. Again, Nolan and Jim both talked about this. At SRI, we celebrated champions. They're the people. They're, the, they're passionate. They, they find important um, um, opportunities. Um, they have great value creation skills, the things we're talking about. And they persevere, no excuses. And we had a saying at SRI, no champion, no project, no exception. If somebody wouldn't raise their hand and say, I will do all these things, I will persevere, I will never give up, we didn't do it, at least not with them. Because in today's world, if somebody doesn't raise their hand, you're kidding yourself. It's just not going to happen. No champion, no project, no exception. Teams. It used to be you could form the best team, say, in Cleveland, and you could probably get away with it for a while. Today, you can't. Most of the smartest people are somewhere else. You have to work really hard to put together the best teams. And of course, finding them and assembling them is a project. And human values matter even more in this world, because if you're going to intensely collaborate with someone, if they have bad values or you can't depend on them, you can't trust them, it'll stop. It'll absolutely stop. And Siri is an example. When we put Siri together, we literally put together a list of who are the best people in the world for this particular um, opportunity. We literally wrote down the names of all the best people, and that's the team we assembled. If you don't do that today, you're just hoping that some other team doesn't do that. So you all know the um, development of innovations where you start off with R&D, a new um, idea, and you design it, you develop it. And of course, the cost goes up um, rapidly when you do that. What we've learned is that most mistakes happen right at the beginning. That's where the opportunity is. Most of the things that people work on, as I said, would not matter even if they were successful with them. That is the opportunity. That's where there's at least the factor of two improvement in innovative performance across America. And we just started the program called Innovation for Impact, working with the National Science Foundation to help them with their big center programs, to help them be more productive as they start developing um, and working on their programs. So I've already mentioned that innovation is about learning. Um, so you know, here's the product development curve. You do R&D. Um, you address an important need. Um, hopefully, you make a profit for a while, at least, and make an impact on the world. Um, and then you have to start over again. So it never is constant cycles, right? Well, connecting an important need with new knowledge is not an event. It's a process. And if you can do that, if you can make those connections faster than your competitors, that's a huge advantage. Anything you can do to make that go faster is good news. And that's the value creation part of innovation. You're literally creating the value. And until it gets into the marketplace, it's not an innovation. Again, the definition of innovation and examples. And several people made this comment this morning. So we don't want to confuse value creation from innovation. We need to think about what they are. I'm going to go quickly on this, but 
you know, when you ask, if you could ask yourself, well, what are the principles that allow for the most rapid learning? And they're experiential learning. You have to do it. You want rapid feedback. You want complementary teams. You want mentors or people who can help you. You, have to, you want to represent the knowledge in different ways. You want to have productivity tools. You want to have challenging incentives. You want to have the right human values. You want to focus on the big ideas and don't get lost and work in a complete system. We have a program to teach algebra, um, eighth grade algebra, that follows these principles. And it's got the biggest improvement we have ever seen from any program we have evaluated, most of them. Most of them don't do anything because they violate these principles. If you want to learn fast, these are the things you have to do. And think about a classroom today. Is that experiential learning? No. Rapid feedback? No. Complementary teams? No. Practitioner mentor? Not really. Multiple representations, if the teacher is great. Productivity tools? Maybe. Challenging incentives? Um, I suspect that most of the people are in there to try and find a date for the weekend, right? They don't really want to be there. Um, human values? No. Big ideas? A great teacher will do that. Is it a complete system? No. In other words, today's educational system violates most of the fundamental educational principles that leads to rapid learning. So Nolan and others mentioned what's happening that's going to transform the university because of these principles. As more and more people learn how to implement these, it's going to make the conventional classroom look really like a buggy, a listen buggy. Experiential learning. And again, that's what CASE is working so hard to put a family of programs in to do that. So what's the definition of customer value? How many of you have a definition for customer value? The definition we like is customer benefits over cu customer costs, benefits over costs. Are benefits and costs quantitative, or are they perceptual? They're all perceptual. The way you think of a cost for some item is, can be completely different from somebody else, one company to another. They're all perceptual. Only your customer decides. Benefits and costs are perceived by the customer, not by us. So some of you might like to have a Lamborghini for um, $1,000. Some of you probably would buy that, right? Brand new Lamborghini. How many of you want a Lamborghini for $10 million? Probably not. How many of you like yellow more than red? Would you pay a little bit more if you could get a red car because you like red cars? Maybe not a lot, but some. It's all perception. It's all based on your perception. There's a hierarchy of value, too. From commodities to products to services to experiences to higher meaning. As you work your way up, the value you create goes up. So we had the example of what is a pair of was it shoes or pants? I guess it was pants from Nolan this morning. A $6 item, all the value is in the design and everything else. People were trying to move up the value hierarchy. So Nokia used to make good, solid phones, right? You could bounce them on the floor, put them in the bathtub, and it didn't matter. And then Apple came along with a smartphone, iPad, iTunes for services, Siri for experiences, and the brand of Steve Jobs that if you buy Apple products, you're smart, sophisticated, clever, with it. And if you buy those other products, well, I'm sorry. You're just a little bit behind the times. What's the value of that? Apple gets 90, over 90% 90 of the profit from the smartphone business. Nokia didn't do that. They went away. Steve Jobs created the most valuable company in the history of the world. And he didn't stop there. He worried about every detail. If you've ever been to one of the Apple stores, it's an experience. The service is great, but it's an experience. And it reinforces the image that you're smart, you're hip, you get it. There's enormous value in that. And most companies don't appreciate all the different ways they can create value for their customers. Here's another definition. How many of you say the word value proposition every day at work? Probably all of you, right? Do you have a common definition for it? Probably not. At least for the thousands of executives I dealt with in academics, we're, still, we're yet to find a team where even 
three or four people have a definition that makes sense and is similar. So this is our definition. What's the important need, the market and customer need? What's your approach? What's your working hypothesis for the solution and for the business model? What are the benefits per cost, which are now recognized as the value? And what's the competition or the alternatives? You can make a value proposition as long as you want, but you can't make it shorter than this. Everything you do in your business life or as an academic or a government official, you should at least answer these four questions. At least these four. If you take one thing from this talk, this slide is it. Everything you do should be able to answer these four questions. So the goal, address an important customer and market need with a new compelling and defensible approach, both for the solution and for the business model that has superior benefits per cost when compared to the competition or the alternatives. And successful value propositions are quasi-quantitative. Bigger, better, faster, cheaper, don't mean a thing. Bigger than what? Faster than what? Does it matter? Is it perceptually significant? You know, you need to be able to be very specific about what you're doing. And the value proposition ought to be easy to understand and repeat. Now, here's, I'm sorry some of these slides got uh, scrambled a little bit when we um, switched over. Here's what most presentations look like. They look, we call these big A's. So somebody comes in to you as an executive and they say, um, I want you to listen to my value proposition. The need's obvious. Everybody knows what the need is. I want you to listen to my approach for the next two hours. Uh, the benefits of cost, they're obvious too, and there's no competition. How many presentations have you heard like that? And here you are, totally confused. You're trying to figure out, what is this person talking about? It's like, it's like a mother with a brand new baby, right? And you know it's five minutes old, and you come in, and you look at the baby, and it's all scaly and covered with goo, and, and you go, eh. And she looks at you and she says, this is the most beautiful baby in the world, isn't it? And you go, yeah, yeah, get me out of here, right? <laughs> and she can see that look on your face. You can't hide it. Who does she blame? Does she blame her baby, or does she blame you? She blames you. And when somebody comes in and gives you a presentation like this, if you don't immediately tell them they're a genius, they blame you. But they're not giving you the information you need as executives to be able to help them. The amount of waste that we see presentations like this, almost every university, this is what you see. Most government labs, this is what you see. Most companies, this is what you see. And you can test this now when you go around the world. There are models like um, 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 Agile technology where you iterate rapidly with the customer. Those are very good programs. Um, but um, they're really not what you want. They don't create enough new value when you're just kind of constantly interacting with your customer. That's not enough in today's world. It creates value. You can design products that way. So um, the D School at Stanford is a wonderful program that teaches students how to design products and things like that. But the truth is, that's not going to move the dial in America today. So what would? What would? Here's a chart we call um, the three Cs. So you have customers, you have competition, and you have um, capabilities. So you, those are your capabilities. Uh, where do you want to be on this chart? Anybody think we ought to be in the middle? The middle is a terrible place to be. That's where your competition is. That is a terrible place to be. You want to be in the white space, where there are customers and where you can do something new and valuable. And you want to have what's called beachhead customers, ones you can own that where you can start, early adopters who are going to love your product even though it's not perfect. That's where you want to be in today's world. A big, important market where the, there's a, a customer pain point, we call it, and you have a chance to own that market and create a big company. So this is the way at SRI we thought about that. 
we were always trying to figure out, where's the white space? What's the need? How big is the market? Is it a billion dollar market? And what's happening to the competition? We didn't want there to be a lot of competition. We had to prove it, of course. We couldn't just say it. And then we would start building um, ventures and innovations around those ideas. It's a very different approach. This is what Steve Jobs did. This is what Google did. This is what, I mean, all of the billion dollar ventures that SRI created are all like this. They're all like this. Find the white space, a big opportunity, put together the solution, get the best partners. Basic stuff, but it makes all the difference. So here's, a, here's an example. So most companies who build consumer products, uh, let's go back away. AM radio, then FM, better. Then black and white TV, better. Then color TV, then HD TV. Now we have 4K, then we have 3D, and we just keep on going, right? And of course, when we got records, um, the quality is pretty good, and you could take it home. Marie Tassan at Sony came up with the first shirt pocket radio. The quality wasn't great, but you could walk around with it. Then he came up with a Walkman. Oh, cool. Look, he's in white spaces. Oh, those are new, those are new areas. Interesting, huh? And then we have PDAs. And where did Steve Jobs first go? An iPod. Extreme convenience. How many companies could have built an iPad? Dozens and dozens, right? But Steve Jobs thought this way. Where's the white space? And then he did it with the iPhone. Yeah, there's other products that like it, but he positioned his off to the side so they'd be unique products. Then the iPad, and so it goes. How many billion, opp billion dollar opportunities do you think are on just this one slide? Do you think it's one, 10? It's probably hundreds. Just these two dimensions of customer value. How many companies think this way? So we make a big distinction at SRI about what's important versus what's interesting. We want a big, important, growing opportunity in the white space. Um, at SRI, we're in Silicon Valley. If we couldn't form companies that were worth at least a couple hundred million dollars, we couldn't work with the best partners, we couldn't recruit the best CEOs, um, it, it, it just wouldn't, wouldn't work. It wasn't Kurt. It was the marketplace. It was the world we're in. And we were always shooting for more, a billion dollars. And we wanted solutions that were significantly better. Defensible solution and business model and beachhead again. And a place where the customer really cares. And we call it a painkiller, not a vitamin. A high priority. Somebody wants to really get this problem solved. And the champions who were, who were driving this had to really care too. They had real empathy for their customers and want to do a great job for them. And they developed deep knowledge as they went along. So how did we do this? We had what we called value creation forums. These are meetings where we would re meet regularly, and people would present their value propositions. Brainstorming doesn't work. I think everybody probably knows that by now. You, know, you get together, you have a party, you eat some pizza and a Coke, you go back to your job, and that's it. Right? It's a social event. It's not a value creation event. Um, I'm going to tell you how we set these up. But basically, the amplifier of value is team feedback. Having multiple people critique you what worked, what doesn't work, and doing that continuously. At SRI, they never stopped. Every two to four to six weeks, people had to stand up, present their value propositions, and get critiqued. That is the amplifier of value creation. That is a way, if you want to learn fast, you can do it. So what is the process for these? They're formed around a specific topic. As I said, they're recurring every two to six weeks. They're positive meetings. They're not like faculty meetings, you know, where people are trying to prove who's the smartest person in the room. That doesn't work, right? That shuts down your creativity, your juices, and just gets people frustrated. We had a facilitator um, who would make sure that the meetings um, were positive and went well. Um, there'd be diverse um, people. We'd have financial people in the meetings. We'd have outside venture capitalists. We'd have all kinds of people as appropriate what we needed to get the feedback. 
As I said, they'd be a facilitator. He had a very modest budget. Basically, you know, buy the pizza and the Coke. That's what these meetings were about. Um, people only spoke for 10 minutes. Um, after they spoke, they had to be there silently. They couldn't argue back with the audience, because if you're arguing, you're not listening. And they'd have a buddy who'd take notes and meet with them afterwards. There'd be three to five presentations per forum, and we expected people to iterate continuously between these meetings. The magic in a meeting like this happens because when you're giving the presentation, you can't see what you're doing wrong. You can't see it. I don't care who you are. You can't see it. So you get your feedback, and you're wondering, oh my gosh. But then you sit down, and the next person stands up, and then you can see it. You can see what doesn't work. But as importantly, every once in a while, somebody does something really well. And you want to do that yourself. Everybody in this room, everybody at SRI, you know, straight A students from the best schools in the world, extremely competitive, always number one in their class. They're sitting there, and somebody does a great job. And the room goes, oh, I want to be better than that the next time I come in. And that creates a ratchet that gets improvement going faster than anything you could say to somebody about how to improve. So here's what most people do. At the start, you don't know very much at all. You probably have a guess. If you work on an interesting problem, yeah, you'll get there. But probably by the time you get there, nobody cares. Because again, remember, you've got 500 million people who are competing with you all over the world today. So at SRI, we'd focus on big, important problems. And we'd start, and we'd have an initial target, which is a guess, right? In the beginning, you don't know anything, really. It's a guess. But it got us stirring, and we could see that there was a white space there. And then we'd go through this value creation process I'm describing. And the amazing thing is how often we ended up in a good place. We never ended up where we thought. Never. Never. But we almost always ended up in a good place. That's one of the secrets of SRI. Very few people do that. Very few people. We make a big deal about removing risk. Technologists all want to build the final product on day one. And we always said, no, we want you to take the risk out. And there are lots of ways to take risk out without spending money. We also said, bring it to life. Make it so vivid that people can't forget it. This was done with 3D software. It took two weeks. And it's actually a moving example. It looks, it's photorealistic. It looks brand new. And it's a buoy that has um, little artificial muscle um, um, columns inside of those red um, uh, tubes. And it creates power that runs the, the buoy. And we created 12 additional patent disclosures by doing that simulation. It cost almost nothing. You do that first. You do the things where there's risk, get rid of it, and do that first, bring it to life. I need to wrap up. I'm going to, um, I think I've talked about a lot of this. I want to give you um, two last examples um, so you know what I'm, um, the, kind of the, what I'm, I'm talking about. So here's, here's a big, important market. The number of children who are crippled, the number of older people who can't walk, um, is in the hundreds of millions around the world. And the solutions they have today are terrible. And people around the world are building exoskeletons to um, strengthen people's limbs. Now, the problem is that they have to attach this thing somehow to your body. Now, imagine if you're 90 years old, and you have to put that thing on in the morning. You, have, you, you feel like you literally are a robot. It's so heavy. It's so cumbersome. It only lasts for a couple hours. Then you have to recharge it. It's not a solution. So our team in the value creation forum said, well, what are the ways to attach something to the body? What about a Chinese puzzle where you stick your fingers in, and it grabs, and then you push them in, and you can pull them out? Why can't we put that on your leg and have sensors so that it can tell when you're moving? And when you're moving, it'll grab hold to your leg. And when you stop, it'll let go. Why don't we build a pair of pants that have those characteristics? These pants can be worn all day. They're so light, the amount of power they take. 
um, means it can, again, uh, work all day, and just put them on like a pair of pants. A completely different way to think about the solution by exploring all the dimensions of customer value. Um, I'll end with Siri. We were working on a major research program for DARPA called the KOL Project. And as soon as, we, actually before we started the program, we started developing value propositions for possible applications for it, probably about a dozen. And we weren't spending a lot of money. We were just iterating, you know, can we come up with a solution? Can we find a white space? Can we create a business model? And finally, we found one. And we hired what I said we considered to be the best team in the world. Uh, six months later, Steve Jobs uh, called us up, said he wants to buy the company, and he wouldn't leave us alone. He was calling up our CEO multiple times a day to buy the company. And eventually, we sold it to him. Meanwhile, we called up every other company you could imagine who should have been interested in this, and we couldn't get their attention. Only Steve Jobs understood what it could do for Apple. And he eventually bought it, and it created over $50 billion of new value for Apple. And now it's one of the most important projects in Apple. And those kind of interfaces are the future of smart devices and just about every other intelligent device in the world. They're too complicated. They're too hard. We need a better way to interact with them. So I wanted to end with a value proposition for you. So the need that we've been talking about today is that the world really is uh, moving faster, we have intense competition, but there's an amazing number of great opportunities if we do the right thing. And today we're not. Um, you heard from the speakers this morning, and I showed you some data, we're not keeping up. We're not succeeding. And the approach I'm basically presenting to you is to use innovation best practices, to change the way you work, work in a more productive way, a way that creates more value for your customers and for society. And it's based on very fundamental learning principles. The benefits per cost of this is that I found, I think we can at least double the performance around the world, around America. And at a place like SRI, we went from just about bankrupt to being one of the most valuable research labs in the world. With the same people, same technology, but by working different. There are many approaches that are different than this. Um, Agile, I mentioned, um, Crossing the Chasm, Blue Ocean Strategy. We've all read these books. They talk about mostly the what of innovation. They don't talk about the how. We need the how. And what we've included here are basically a few very powerful fundamental principles, which I think is the most efficient way that I've found that we've found to be able to do this. One last, um, one last comment for the younger people in the audience. My hope for you is that you will find a big, important problem that you are passionate about, and that you will learn everything you can about innovation, value creation, um, and entrepreneurship. And I can almost guarantee, if you do those two things, you will make a difference. As Steve Jobs said, you'll make a dent in the universe. You'll work with some of the best people in the world. You'll work hard, but I bet you'll also have a lot of fun. No one said that this morning. And when you look back to the retirement home, you look at a professional life that was well spent, and you'll be able to say, you know what? I really did make a contribution to society. That's my hope for you. Thank you. Sure. All right. Um, we're not going to have time for, for full audience questions, but I did want to ask Kurt one uh, important one. <clears throat> when uh, the concepts of just-in-time and quality control sort of yes. uh, made a dent in the uh, um, manufacturing yes. world, and yes. they were quickly subscribed to by, yeah. by manufacturing, or at least within the order of a decade or two. Yet you've shown, all right, three. <laughs> you've shown in examples that, that companies yeah. that innovate well and have a how-to yes. instead of how have an advantage, yet yes. you don't see this sort of same, we need to do this, we need to jump in. Um, why is that? What's going on? Well, first off, America, if you go back to um, Deming and um, Ono Sana Toyota, who was, 
who, who built the total quality management movement. In America here, we ignored them. Cleveland's a perfect place. Cleveland ignored those people for decades. And literally hundreds, if not thousands, of companies went away. And during the 80s, there was one book after another talking about the end of the American era. It was the end of America. Do you remember that? Because we weren't smart enough to pay attention to this better way of working that Japan had pioneered. Now, as you point out, everybody does that. You have to do that. It's a much smarter way to work. I would say we're in the same state now, but with innovation. We're still basically in denial. We still think America doesn't have to worry about the competition. And that the old ways are going to be enough. But the world is changing. And this meeting, thanks to you folks, is an example of that. And the kind of programs you're putting together is what needs to happen across America. And it is happening across America to transform how we think about innovation. And I think America is in the best position to do that of any country. I've worked all over the world. I think you know, because of you folks, I think we're eventually going to get there. It's going to be painful. But I'm very optimistic about the future of America because of people like you. Thank you. OK, thank you. Okay. Thank you.